Hello, my name is Dr. Bonnie Kaplan. I'm at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. And I'm going to speak to you on this video about a very narrow area of the research on nutrition and mental health, focusing on the work that um, is on trauma, post-trauma, and PTSD symptoms. So this is an overview of what I'll be speaking about. First, about the natural disasters and PTSD data. Secondly, about what I see as a giant social experiment that we're conducting in Western societies. Thirdly, why nutrition is so relevant. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to invite you to consider the financial implications of ignoring this important body of literature. So first, let's start out with the post-disaster research. Uh, this is a map of uh, a part of the South Island of New Zealand focusing on Christchurch. From 2010 to 2011, in a 12-month span, they had about 8,000 earthquakes and aftershocks. This was a very stressed population, obviously. When the earthquake started in September 2010, Professor Julia Rucklidge at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch happened to be studying the potential benefit of broad spectrum nutrient formulas for the treatment of symptoms of mental disorders. Now, when the earthquake struck, she was able to locate some people who happened to be taking one of the broad spectrum formulas at the time of the earthquake, and also a group who were part of their research, but for whatever reason, they were not taking it at that time. And what she showed is that people who were taking a broad spectrum of minerals and vitamins, which I'll be calling micronutrients, that these people were much more resilient and responded, um, really recovered much better from the stress of the earthquake than people who were not taking it. So then, when their second really massive earthquake hit in February of 2011, Julia and her colleagues did a randomized control trial. Now this was no longer in people who had a particular diagnosis. It was not a clinical sample. It was the general population of Christchurch. What you see in front of you in the bright green line is the people who were randomized received B-complex. And as you can see, their um, stress, which is measured on the DAS, the Depression, Anxiety, and Stress Scale, was significantly down by week two, and by the end of the study in week four, it was still decreased a lot. And at one year follow-up, it had gone down even more. The same was true in the red line, the people who were randomized to receive the broad spectrum formula, which has about 30 minerals and vitamins in it. And also there was a significant improvement, which was improved even more at one year. What's especially interesting is to put in the black line that indicates clinical cutoff. And from that, you can see that by week two, both of those groups were in the normal range. They were below clinical cutoff for having significant amount of stress. And finally, look at the pale green line. That's the group that was not randomized to one of the nutrient formulas, but simply received treatment as usual. They, some of them went to see psychiatrists, counselors, or whatever. And from that, you can see that by week four, they were still in the elevated clinical range. And at one year follow-up, they were better. They were in the normal range, although not as good as the people who received the nutrients. And this is a large effect size and uh, very significant results. In addition, um, Julia and her colleagues had a measure of probable PTSD. And so they knew that at baseline, 68% of the people who were later randomized to get a nutrient supplement, 68% met criteria for probable PTSD. In just four weeks, the people who received either B-complex or a broad spectrum formula were down to only 19% rate of probable PTSD. So this is one of those places where I invite you to consider the financial implications of eliminating probable PTSD in the majority of the public in just four weeks. We had an opportunity for a partial replication when we had a flood hit in southern Alberta in 2013. Now, this was not 8,000 floods, it was one flood. And so when Julie and I decided together to do a clinical trial, we didn't really think we would see the same thing as happened after all those thousands of earthquakes in uh, Christchurch. But in fact, we did. 
So it's a very clear replication. The green and red lines, again, are people who were randomized to get B-complex or a broad spectrum formula. And in this case, all three groups were randomized. And the group that had been randomized to get vitamin D at just 1,000 IUs a day, that was our active comparator. We, we expected them to get a bit better, and they did. But it was only the other two groups that went into the normal range. So this is what I've shown you so far using the depression, anxiety, and stress scale stress variable. And this is what happened to the people who got micronutrients uh, in the earthquake. This is what happened with the stress score for people who got micronutrients in the flood. This is the line for the earthquake comparator treatment as usual. So this is their stress levels, which did not go down as far in four to six weeks. Here's the flood comparator. That was the vitamin D. And here is that black line again. This shows clinical cutoff. So what happened was we have a clear replication of the benefit of micronutrients resulting in improving stress levels into the um, normal range in uh, two settings, two countries, two crises. What is the alternative? Well, unfortunately, we're able to look at some data on that. After those studies, we had massive forest fires in northern Alberta uh, centered around the Fort McMurray area in 2016. I went to our government, I went to our provincial health services, I went to psychiatry, and I, I just kept asking, would you look at the previous studies? There's something we can do to help the people. Even if you won't let us hand out pills of nutrients because people seem to think this would be dangerous, which is ridiculous, but anyway, um, they just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. And so finally, um, the dietitians apparently told psychiatry that they would put a sentence in a brochure that they were handing out, and the sentence said something like, be sure to try to eat well. Now, I don't know about the people listening to this, but I, I think that just sounds silly. Um, these are people, thousands of people lost their homes. Many more thousands were displaced for several months. If you don't have a kitchen, if you're not able to cook, what good is it to tell people to try to eat healthy? And why couldn't they have just said, go buy a, a bottle of B-complex over the counter? It's cheap and easy and safe. So what happened after the Fort McMurray fires? Well, as I said, we have unfortunately some comparator information. The vertical line in the middle is when the fire occurred in June of 2016. And this is the graph of physician visits. And if you look at the green line, you see that the number of referrals for physician visits increased significantly after the fire for people for mood disorders. The blue line shows the increase in physician visits for people with anxiety problems. And the pink line at the bottom did not increase as much, but that was physician visits for substance abuse disorders. So we have clear evidence of escalating mood and anxiety disorders in a very stressed population that obviously from our earlier data we're pretty confident could have been, if not eliminated, at least um, helped. And then there's the financial angle. Think about the increased cost of the physician visits. So for those of you who are watching only uh, out of interest in PTSD, I'm not going to talk about that anymore, but I'm going to try to embed the information in some broader information regarding nutrition and mental health. And this next section I call our giant social experiment. Some of you may know the difference between whole food and processed food, but you probably haven't given too much thought about what the World Health Organi Organization defines as the third category, which is ultra-processed food. Ultra-processed food is the worst of the worst. It's the food that is mostly chemicals with virtually no nutrients remaining. In fact, I'm not sure why we call it food. So it turns out we have some very disturbing information in North America. In the Canadian Community Health Survey data from 2004, which is the most recent data we have from that survey, 48%, let's say half, of the caloric intake of all Canadians in that year came from this low level of, quote, food. People who were eating half their dietary intake, their caloric intake, was basically nutrient-free, uh, ultra-processed food. 
We have more recent data from 2012 from the United States. This is the N. Haynes research. And what they showed in 2012 was that 61% of the caloric intake of all Americans was from ultra-processed stuff that we still call food. So we have to ask what happens when we eliminate half of the nutrients in a person's diet. Well, it turns out people who do research on nutrition and mental health know that, that this research has already been done. It's 70 years old. After World War II, the starvation experiments conducted at University of Minnesota included a study in which they took 36 normal healthy men, put them on a 50% diet, 50% of a normal caloric nutrient intake, and kept them on it for six months. And this, these are the signs of suboptimal nutrition that they observed. And what you see here are the primary symptoms are of depression, anxiety disorders, and even some ADHD with inability to concentrate. So the impact of decreasing nutrient intake uh, by 50% is not a mystery. It's known. And the really concerning thing to me is that it's affecting our populations from a very early age. There are only a few studies on children, but I'm going, and I'm going to show you just one. But it's very worrisome about what's happening to children with developing brains. Now, this is from the University of Alberta, published in Pediatrics just a couple months ago. And it studied about 3,000 children uh, in Nova Scotia. In 2011, the research team evaluated these kids for how many of uh, nine health recommendations they met criteria for. In other words, six of them were on diet, uh, two of them were on restricted screen time, and one was on physical activity. So nine lifestyle recommendations, mostly dietary, but not totally. Then in 2014, they pulled the healthcare data for those children and asked the question, who was referred for medical appointments for mental health problems? And this is what they found. For every additional health recommendation met, that was associated with 15% fewer physician visits for mental disorders. So not only was there less suffering in families, but again, I ask you to consider the financial implications of ignoring these important studies. Next, I want to address why nutrition is so relevant um, because it should be taught in schools, but it's not. I don't think this is even taught very well in most medical schools, but the fact is, when we eat minerals and vitamins, we are feeding our brains <clears throat> the cofactors that are needed for metabolism. So suppose you have a chemical, we'll call it A, and for metabolism, it has to be converted to chemical B. And you know most metabolic reactions are dependent upon enzymes. And so this enzymatic reaction should be just fine, right? Well, not so, not unless the enzyme has the required number of cofactors that it needs in order to do the conversion to uh, chemical B. And the cofactors are minerals and vitamins. So I'm going to show you an example of how this works. This is a tiny little bit of tryptophan metabolism. Tryptophan and serotonin are in red just because people know those names. And every arrow is an enzymatic reaction. Every step of these is a metabolic step. And you can click on them on the internet and see, for example, for tryptophan to be broken down to 5-hydroxy-L-tryptophan, we know it needs at least three minerals. Similarly, for serotonin to be broken down to this chemical, this has two B vitamins and a trace mineral, molybdenum. And one last example, for tryptophan to be converted here, you need six minerals and vitamins. And it goes on and on with thousands and thousands of metabolic steps. You can look up the nutrients that are required. So the, the message, the take home message is, if you're not feeding your brain abundant amounts of these vitamins and minerals, and we already know our population is feeding it only 50% of what is needed, then these enzymes cannot do their best work and these brain pathways are going to be sluggish, inefficient, or suboptimal. I'm going to close this recording talking a little bit about budgetary implications, and I'm going to do it by presenting a case study that's already published, and the reference is below. 
It's about a boy who we call Andrew, not his real name, who had a lot of problems with stress and anxiety as a very young child. And then when he was around age 10, it, it uh, evolved or emerged that he was also beginning to have hallucinations, delusions, psychosis, symptoms of OCD. He was a very sick child and was treated for six months as an inpatient in the mental health department of a tertiary care pediatric hospital in Calgary, Alberta. He was put on various kinds of medications and no medication resulted in significant improvement and he was discharged and sent home. He was also referred to the outpatient mental health clinic where his parents requested treatment with a broad spectrum micronutrient formula since medications had not helped him. I was called in to help out with the data, which is published, as I said, and this is a graph of his daily psychosis symptom score as it went to zero, taking the micronutrients. This is his visual hallucinations in blue, auditory hallucinations in red as they went to zero, taking the micronutrients. And then we called in a health economist and asked uh, for a comparison between the six months of inpatient treatment to the immediately following six months where the child was successfully treated on micronutrients. And as you can see, there was this very dramatic cost savings of 98%. So again, consider the loss to our healthcare budget by not paying attention to this research. So this is just a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of information we have on nutrition and mental health. This is how to reach me, and I'm especially interested in talking to anyone who wants to discuss how to influence policy. Thank you very much.